Welcome everyone to the <clears throat> this part of the Theodorsen lecture. And in this lecture, I'll be talking about the derivation of the circulatory force contribution in the unsteady aerodynamic model. Now, as you remember last time, we were able to derive an expression for the non-circulatory force experienced by a wing during an unsteady maneuver due to the added mass force, but since we did not include any circulation or we did not introduce any circulation in the last lecture, the uh, force that we derived is only the non-circulatory portion. So in this, in this lecture, we will derive the circulatory force based on satisfying the cutout condition at the trailing edge. So to start off, the non-circulatory solution alone doesn't satisfy the cutter condition. And it does not satisfy that condition because as you remember last time we came up for with an expression for the difference in the pressure between the upper and lower surface and that term did not equal to zero at theta equal to zero which corresponds to the wing the wing's trailing edge so the uh, the difference in pressure between the upper and lower surface at the trailing edge in the non-circulatory contribution of that difference in pressure did not go to zero did not go to zero which would imply that there is a jump in pressure at the trailing edge which would imply that the velocity that there is some component of velocity that's moving from the upper from the lower to the upper surface um and that would entail an infinite velocity at the trailing edge because the trailing edge has a um and it because the trailing edge is essentially infinitely thin so if there is a velocity of fluid trying to come across it because of the fact that there is a difference in pressure the fluid has to turn at an infinitely small radius along the trailing edge and thus it has to go infinitely fast to make that turn so recall the disturbance velocity component, which we came up with the last lecture. If you remember, U prime was equal to Q theta over 2 sine theta. And that's the relation between velocities um, in the circle plane and in the plate plane. So this term here is the tangential velocity at the circle in the circle plane which would correspond to the, um, the horizontal disturbance velocity in the plate plane. In plate plane. Anyway, at the trailing edge, At the trailing edge, theta is equal to zero, which would entail that u prime would equal to q theta at two sine of zero, which would equal to essentially would go to infinity unless q theta is equal to zero. So if q theta is equal to zero, you have a zero over zero and you have to, using L'Hopital's rule and taking the limit as theta approaches zero for the numerator and the denominator, you come to a finite expression. Now, 
Now, recall equation 257 that we, sorry, 5257, which we uh, arrived to last lecture. Q, actually, let me change the color. Q theta, sorry, not Q theta, it's just Q of theta and T is equal to 2 pi. 0 to pi of w a sine squared psi d psi over cosine psi minus cosine theta. So we came up with an expression that, connect, that connects the vertical velocity of the wing to the tangential velocity in the circle plane. So we want to ensure that this expression would go to zero at theta equal to zero. So this will be the focus of this lecture. So two over pi of zero pi, w a sine squared psi d psi, sorry, d psi over cosine psi minus cosine of theta should equal to zero at theta equal to zero. Now, how do we accomplish this task? So recall that last lecture, we came up with a potential flow solution composed of um, source and sink sheets such that we satisfy the no penetration boundary condition. So if we would want to satisfy the color condition by imposing an additional potential flow solution on top of the existing one, we have to make sure that whatever flow potential solution that we impose, whatever we choose to um, use, that solution should not, um, should not mess with the no penetration boundary condition that we already solved for. So we need to make sure that whatever extra flow pattern we superimpose on top of the source and sink vortex sheets, whatever we choose, that it would not cause us to break the no penetration boundary condition that we already uh, satisfied by the earlier solution. So, We must superimpose a flow pattern that essentially cancels the non circulatory value of Q theta of zero and T, so Q theta at theta equal to zero while maintaining the no penetration boundary condition. Now, how does essentially Theodorson accomplish that task? So, Theodorson accomplishes this task with doing the following, or using the following, using bound vortices in a bound vortex sheet, as well as a wake vortex sheet, so a wake of counter-rotating vortices that continually move away from airfoil at free stream speed. So essentially what he does, he, all right, he takes the wing here, he inserts a 
vortex wake sheet that starts from the trailing edge and goes all the way to infinity. And he puts another vortex sheet, bound vortex sheet on the wing. And using those, you satisfy the color condition such that the velocity at the trailing edge or Q theta at the trailing edge in the circular plane goes to zero, which means that the um, velocity at the trailing edge in the plate plane leaves smoothly while also maintaining uh, Kelvin's circulation theorem, which, which says that circulation in the entire system should always sum to zero. All right, so moving on. As I said, the uh, wake originates at the trailing edge. in the plate plane, they lie on the x-axis. Beyond x equal to b, because this is where the trailing edge is. And then in the circle plane, they lie on the c-axis which is the in that, which is the axis analogous to the x axis but in the circle plane and they lie on that axis beyond c equal to b over 2 which is the radius of the circle we use and these diagrams here show the circle in the plate plane with the position of the wake vortex sheet now, as we said, well, as we said, we need to make sure that we maintain Kelvin's circulation theorem, which would entail that we, we would have to insert vortices bound to the wing as well, such that the circulation of the wake and the bound vortices cancels with each other. But there is the added thing that we need to, there is the added reason for adding the bound vortices, which is the fact that we need to to maintain the circle, right, to maintain this circle as a streamline, whatever vortex or whatever wake vortex sheet we insert outside the circle, we have to insert uh, corresponding image vortices inside the circle to maintain the streamline aspect of the circle, which in tail turns the wing into a streamline and turning the circle and the wing into a streamline implies satisfying the no penetration boundary condition. So image or bound vortices must be placed to maintain circle and plate as streamlines. And what does that implicitly do? It satisfies no penetration boundary condition. Now, if the solution of the circulatory portion satisfies the no boundary condition and the solution that we already had for the non-circulatory bit so the if the solution that we have for the circulatory portion portion satisfies the no penetration boundary condition and the solution that we came up with last lecture satisfies the no penetration boundary condition for the non-circulatory portion of the force adding those two flow patterns together still satisfies the condition because of the linearity of the solution because of the fact that potential 
uh, potential flow solutions can be superimposable because they're linear. So let's start off at let's start off with examining some point P in the circle plane on the surface of the circle. So this point P lies at a radius again B over two and at some theta angle. Now we will place some vortex in the wake with a strength of minus gamma O and at some distance at some distance D. To maintain the circle as a streamline, we need to place an image vortex inside of the circle with an opposite vortex strength and at some distance of b squared over 4d. And I'm sure you guys have already um, done a similar exercise in the complex potential module, but if not, you can verify for yourself that these two vortices will create a streamline on the circle surface. All right, so we will draw two lines to from point P to either of the vortices. So the vortex, the blue vortex, which is in the wake, produces some velocity at point P that is perpendicular to the line that we drew, right? So this is perpendicular. And we will call this velocity Q minus of uh, absolute of Q minus. Now the same thing happens here, and let me move this away. The vortex inside of the circle also produces some velocity perpendicular to the line connecting um, point P to the vortex. And we will call that one um, Q plus absolute. And I want you guys to note here that the notation I'm using is to maintain the uh, positive, sorry, the clockwise vortex strength as positive and the counterclockwise vortex strength as negative. All right, so if you draw a tangent line along the circle going through P, we can find the angle the Q plus velocity vector makes with the tangent and the angle the Q minus velocity vector makes with a tangent. And these, ve um, these angles are, and you can check for yourself, theta one minus theta and theta two minus theta. So, let me write this down. We look at a single bound vortex, gamma O, and its image minus gamma O. And the velocity induced at arbitrary point P. Now, we want to get Q theta at P, which is basically the components of the Q plus and Q minus velocities that are tangent to the circle. So we can compute that by getting 
the component of this velocity, tangent to the circle, component of this velocity, tangent to the circle, and adding them up. So Q theta is equal to Q minus cosine theta 2 minus theta minus, because the uh, positive velocity is in the opposite direction, Q absolute Q plus cosine of theta 1 minus theta. Now we know that the um, the velocities induced by a vortex to some point is the following expression, which I did forget to label the radiuses, or label the distances, so we will call the distance from the wake vortex to point P as R2, and we will call the distance from the bound vortex to point P as R2. One. Great, so we know that this is the expression for the velocity from a vortex for the wave vortex, and similarly, the following is the expression for the bound vortex. So these are the expressions of the velocity q minus and q plus at point P. Thus, putting this all together, q theta is equal to gamma over 2 pi of r2 cosine theta 2 minus theta over r2 squared minus r1 cosine of theta 1 minus theta for r1 squared. And this is equation five two seven eight from Bisplingoff. Now we can expand the denominators using the cosine rule. So as a reminder law of cosines would say that if you have some triangle you have an angle theta and you have a, b and c sides a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared minus 2 b c cosine of theta. So on that note, we can look at, um, let me put the highlighter. We can look at this triangle here, and we can also um, look at which triangle? We can also look at this triangle here. So for the blue triangle, we are trying to figure out the R2 and R1 lengths. So we know, we know that this length, well, let me change the color. This length is B over two, and thus for the for the blue box, r1 squared is equal to b over 2 squared plus the other side squared plus so on and so forth. And you can do the same thing for the bigger pink triangle. And you can get the value of r1 and r2 in terms of the rest of the sides and the angle theta. And this is what we do here. And thus, r2 squared is equal to d squared plus b over 2 squared minus 2 d b over 2 cosine theta. And similarly, r1 squared is equal to b squared over 4 d squared plus b over 2 squared minus 2 b squared over 4 d b over 2 cosine of theta. Now we figured out the numerator, the denominator, and now we would like to expand the numerators. And for that, 
let's copy the blue triangle down to here. So this is the blue triangle reproduced and we can send a perpendicular bisector to from the vortex to the line connecting P to the center. Okay. So recall, or not recall, remember that the numerator that we're trying to figure out is R1 cosine. So we are trying to, we're trying to come up with some other way that simplifies the expression R1 cosine of theta 1 minus theta. So I'm going to rewrite this and then we can go back to our triangle. We know that this length here is what? It's the side. So this length here is simply this side cosine of theta. So we can write this down. This is b squared over 4d cosine of theta. Similarly, we know that the large radius, or not the large radius, the radius, which is the bigger hypotenuse, is b over 2. And um, I apologize. I just realized that I forgot to actually man mention the angles of theta 1 and theta 2. So theta 1 is the angle, the line we drew from the vortex center of the bound vortex to, to P makes with the horizontal. And similarly, this is theta 2. So this should aid in the in your understanding of the coming section. Anyway, let's get back to the little geometry problem we have here. Um, and again, as a reminder, what we're trying to do is we are trying to simplify those two terms here with different terms, which I brought this term down here to, uh, to make sure it's still in sight while we're working this out. So since, since this is theta, and we know that this is a 90 degree angle, that means that this is 90 minus theta. And that would mean that this angle is 180 minus 90 minus theta minus theta 1. And that is equal to 90 plus theta minus theta 1. And thus, again, remember, we have another triangle, another triangle with a 90 degree here. So we know this angle and this angle, we can determine this angle. And this angle is 90 minus 90 plus theta minus theta 1, which is equal to theta 1 minus theta, which is the same angle as here. And we also know that this side is simply the difference of the big line and the smaller line segment. So I'm just going to call this y. We know that y is equal to b over 2 minus b squared over 4d cosine theta. We also know that we can come up with another expression for y depending on this right angle triangle. So y itself would essentially be cosine of this angle multiplied by r1. So, I mean, we're phrasing it in another way. I'm just going to write it down here. Cosine of this angle is cosine of theta 1 minus theta, and that is equal to the adjacent line over the hypotenuse, and thus y is equal to r1 cosine of theta 1 minus theta. And thus, this little problem here gives us e red def e, another definition for the numerators we were looking at at the earlier equation. So redefine numerator. We know that y is equal to this expression and this expression, so we can say that r1 cosine of theta 1 minus theta, 
which is this term here, is equal to b over 2 minus b squared over 4d cosine theta. So we can replace the r1 cosine theta 1 minus theta 2 minus theta with the other expression. And similarly, you can do something similar to the other triangle, but I'm not going to go through it now. And we back out that r2 cosine of theta 2 minus theta is equal to b over 2 minus d cosine theta. So we will sub those two expressions into 5, 2, 78. And with some simplification, we get back q. Well, let me write this down. Sub into sub definitions of both the numerator and the denominator we came up with using the cosine rule. Sub redefinitions into equation 5 to 78 and with some simplifications you get q theta is equal to minus gamma o over pi b d squared minus half b squared over d squared plus half b squared minus db cosine of theta. Now recall the, uh, the velocity potential function we got from last lecture. So the velocity potential along the upper surface of circle is found by evaluating 5258, which we should have done last lecture. It's phi uh, velocity potential on the upper surface of the velocity perturbation as a function of theta and t is equal to minus the integral of 0 to pi because we're only concerned with the upper surface of q theta v over 2 d theta and then we can replace the expression that we already came up with and u back out gamma o pi inverse tangent of d minus b over 2 over d plus b over 2 square root 1 plus cosine of theta 1 minus cosine of theta and this is equation 2 282 so next that we have this term we can find the pressure distribution using Bernoulli, using unsteady Bernoulli. So next, we find pressure distribution using unsteady Bernoulli. So PU minus PL is equal to minus 2 rho of u d phi u prime over dx over d phi u prime over dt, where phi u prime is the velocity potential on the upper surface. And we take the partial derivative of that with respect to x and with, with, with respect to time. If you don't remember this expression, then I'd suggest you go back and take a look at the earlier lecture because we derived the expression there. Now, we have a tiny problem here as compared to the non-circulatory force contribution. And the problem is, is that we have D here. We have 
d which is the distance of the vortex in the wake to the center of the circle now the problem is in contrast with the um the sink and source sheets which do not move the wake moves so d is a function of time and thus phi u prime contains d which is a function of time so this partial derivatives uh, partial derivative becomes a little tricky so the problem is that d is a function of t which makes partial partial t complicated now recall the circle to plate transformation and the circle to plate transformation is z is equal to zeta plus b squared over 4 zeta where z is the complex coordinate in the plate plane and zeta is the complex coordinate in the circle plane I mean, this can be rewritten, sorry, uh, rewritten so we can rewrite the complex potential transformation function as the following z minus z, z minus b over z plus b square root is equal to zeta minus b over 2 over zeta plus b over 2. And thus, we can sub in the coordinate of the wake in the, sorry, the coordinate of the wake in the circle plane, which is d, to get an expression in terms of the coordinate of the wake in the plate plane which I'm going to do here. Thus, C minus B over C plus B is equal to D minus B over 2 over D plus B over 2, where D is wake location in circle plane, which we had in the earlier figure schematic of the circle. And C is vortex location. Well, let me just to avoid confusion, keep the words consistent is wake location in plate plane. Now, I have made a redefinition here of C just to match the, um, the canonical way of deriving Theodorson. We've established earlier that C was the was a coordinate in the circle plane. However, in this redefinition, we have repurposed C to mean the location of the wake in the plate plane. For instance, the new redefinition means that if you have a circle and you have some vortex wake here, if this is D, then if you transform to the plate plane, Right here, this is a C. In this repurposing, um, in repurposing or in this redefinition of the term. So I'm gonna put a note here. Note here. 
C is not a circle plane coordinate. Okay, so we will go back to the derivation and we will rewrite equation 5282, which is the velocity potential on the upper surface, is equal to gamma O over pi, and now rewriting the terms inside the inverse tangent, C minus B, one plus cosine theta over C plus B, and then one minus cosine theta, square root, close bracket or parentheses. And remi or remember now that we have assumed that the wake moves with the free stream. Thus, we are going to apply this assumption here or make use of it. Apply assumption. And the wake moves with free stream. What does that mean? That means that the derivative of the location of the wake with respect to time is just u. Now, we sub phi u prime into unsteady Bernoulli and use chain rule for time derivative and that is d phi over dt is equal to d phi dxc dxc dt and that is simply equal to d phi dxc times u applying this results in the following term spl of gamma o is equal to minus rho u gamma o into xc plus b cosine theta over pi b sine theta of c squared plus b squared. And to get the lift, we integrate the difference in pressure between the upper and lower surface across the wing. So integrate pressure difference to get LC, so L gamma O is equal to rho U gamma O over C squared minus B squared. And then just a little note on this term. Note that if C goes to infinity, i.e. the wake vortex moves far, far away from the wing. L gamma O really goes to the study sort of Kadajikowski lift theory. So lift is equal to rho U gamma O. So what does that mean? That means basically that in the unsteady scenario, let's say you have a wake you have a wing, and you have some wake, and the wake is moving as time sort of passes by. Once the wake is effectively at infinity, it means that the wing does not really see an appreciable motion from the wake because the the wake vortex is at infinity, so 
I mean, as far as the wing is concerned, the vortex is at the same location for all subsequent time. And thus it turns into a steady problem. So if there is no unsteady motion, let's say you take a wing, you give it some velocity. So going from rest to the free stream velocity will result in some trailing edge vortex being shed. However, if you maintain that free stream velocity and you don't change it, there will be no more, the, essentially the, the vorticity shed from the trailing edge will decrease as a function of time until effectively the vortex that is shed from the wing when the wing started, which is the starting edge vortex, sorry, the, which is the starting vortex, would move all the way to infinity or effectively really, really far away from the wing. And then the flow becomes completely steady and you get or back out your steady lift value. So that was just an aside note. Now we have only concerned ourselves with a pair of vortices and we need to extend that wake vortex or the pair of vortices to vortex sheets. So here we extend single wake vortex to infinite wake sheet. What does that mean from like the math point of view? It means that we simply replace minus gamma O, which is the vortex strength of the wake vortex with gamma W T C, which is essentially the vortex strength of a very small differential element in the wake. And we integrate from B, from the trailing edge, because the wake starts there, and all the way to infinity, because the wake extends to infinity. And this will result in the following. This will result in the following expression for the circulatory lift, minus rho u from B to infinity of xc over xc squared minus b squared gamma wake as a, that is a function of both xc and time d xc and i'll box this i'll box this in and this is it for the lecture today um the next lecture we will try to reconcile the circulatory lift and the non-circulatory lift. And we will do a little bit of math and putting in our um, harmonic um, velocity boundary condition to back out Theodorsen's, um, the Theodorsen unsteady function, C of K. Anyway, see you next lecture.